I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. One of the most frequently asked questions I get concerns glue. I had a conversation with Scott Bennett about adhesives. Scott has an excellent YouTube channel called Fixing Furniture. and We both want to know more about the differences between hide glue, PVA glue, and epoxy, and why you might use one over another in any given situation. Scott kicks off the conversation. Today I've got Tom Johnson from Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restorations in Gorham, Maine. He's joining me today to talk about the main glues that we use in our workshop. How are you doing today, Tom? Great. How about you, Scott? Fantastic. Thanks for joining me. So, Tom, before we get going, let people know a little bit about your background and your business. Sure. Uh, I've been in business for uh, 41 years, 30 years in Boston and 11 years here in Maine. And prior to that, I worked in my dad's shop. He was a professional furniture restorer and cabinet maker. All of us brothers worked in my dad's shop. I started there in 1964 when I was 13. And uh, three of us went on to have our own shops. That's great. Thanks, Tom. It's wonderful to hear someone that has such a rich history in furniture restoration. Um, so before we get going, um, I've got three different glues that I use in my workshop and you do as well most frequently. Uh, the first one is high glue and you do a lot of antique furniture restorations. I don't do that much of them. Um, and I noticed you carry a glue pot around a lot. So can you kick this off by telling us about high glue? Years ago, when I started in my dad's shop, the primary glue they used was Elmer's white glue, Elmer's glue wall. But there was always this glue pot kind of sitting in the corner and I wondered about that okay. and I was never sure but when I and when I started my own shop we started off using tight bond at that time there was tight bond and, and the Elmers but as I worked more and more on antiques and period antiques uh, I became more curious about hide glue and and started using it so tell our viewers a little bit more about what this hide glue stuff is how's it made well I, I never made it but it's pretty basic they boil down animal connective tissue, it has something to do with the proteins, and it forms a very strong glue. And of course, part of that is, is the hides, hence the word hide glue. And you know, people say the, the horse is going to the glue factory. <laughs> well, I use uh, liquid hide glue. This is a tight bond product. And there's another one yes. on the market called Old Brown. So this is what I use in my workshop, but you use yours from a pot. Can you show us how you mix that up? Sure, and it's really quite easy. I like mixing up hide glue in small batches you know, before each project usually, although it will last for a while, uh, especially if you keep it refrigerated. So I'm using a granular hide glue. It's a higher strength hide glue. And uh, I don't weigh it, but I have a little uh, measuring cup here that I'll fill it to the halfway mark. And now I put in uh, equal amount of water. This is just tap water. Equal amount by volume. Maybe a little bit more. All right. I'll just go let that uh, sit for an hour or two until the uh, hide glue absorbs the water. Okay, a couple hours went by. As you can see that the the water's all absorbed. In fact, it, it looks like it needs more water, but you don't put more water in it. Uh, my old-fashioned glue pot is out of service. I may need to send it to the factory to get uh, repaired. In the meantime, I got a crock pot at Goodwill for like a dollar or something. And I measured it long ago. On low is a, is a good temperature for the glue. So let's let that cook for a while, check it another hour or so. Okay, this has been on for an hour or two. Let's uh, check the temperature. It's good to go. You can see it's a great consistency. If I'm going to use it in my uh, syringe, I'd thin it just a little bit. So that's all there is to it. So Tom, I'm used to using high glue on antiques, and I don't do a lot of antique work, but you do. Can you tell our viewers why you use high glue over PVA? I like using it. It has, a, it has a lot of advantages. Primarily, the reason you use it on period antiques is because they use some sort of glue that has, by definition, to be similar to the high glue we're using now. And so it's compatible with that. So you can take 
a, an old piece apart. And you do scrape a little bit of the excess glue off, but you don't have to scrape it all off because the, the hide glue is compatible with the old hide glue. It must redissolve it, reactivate it. Also, hide glue gives as an advantage in that it's the, it's the easiest glue to reverse. In other words, uh, I recently, in one of my videos, uh, glued down some veneer. When I removed the clamps, discovered it was misaligned. I was able to heat it up with a heat gun or a hair dryer and move it back into position. And uh, also with antiques, when you've glued them together with hide glue, in the future, if something's broken and they need to disassemble it, it can be done a lot easier and without damaging the piece of furniture. So there's a number of reasons to use it. And I think another important thing for people to understand when they're repairing something as well is how to recognize that there's high glue there or isn't. Because as you said, it can be reversed. Um, I noticed that it's um, a yellowy, crystally, brittle type of thing. Is that what yeah. you mean as well? Yeah, uh, crystals is a good word because it does kind of crystallize and, and can scrape off like, like dust. But it's always difficult to know exactly what it is you're looking at. And there's a lot of different types of hide glue because people were making it, you know, a, a couple of hundred years ago, people made their own glue. So you're not quite sure what they were making it out of, some kind of animal products. And, but you can get a feel for it. And you can also recognize more modern glues when you see them too. Uh, they have a tendency to be gooey or flexible and, and opaque in color. Okay, well, why don't we move along to our next typical glue, and that's, uh, there's a lot of different names for it. Carpenter's glue, yellow glue, um, it goes by brand names of Tight Bond, or you mentioned Elmer's as well. I personally use uh, the Lee Valley brand. Um, I'm quite fond of that. It's a cabinet maker's glue. Um, but these glues are water-based, and they clean up easily. Um, but there's a few key things that you need to have for this glue to work properly. Um, Tom, what would be one of those things? Well, for both hide glue and your modern carpenter's glues, you really have to have wood to wood contact. In other words, these glues will not fill spaces. You mentioned that they're water based, so the water evaporates. You know, it, it gets soaked into the wood, it won't fill a gap. You need to have good wood to wood contact. So, clean surfaces on the wood. Um, yeah good, strong wood-to-wood -wood contact. Um, clamping pressure is also important. And also making sure that you spread glue on both surfaces when they come together. Um, yes. If you don't have one of those four elements, you might end up having glue failure. If you don't have enough glue, you might have a, a joint that's glue starved. And I'll give you an example here. This is a piece that was a cutoff from a project. And here I've got a part where the boards didn't meet. This was scrap but here yeah. it's stronger. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break this board and we're gonna see how strong the glue is. Um, wow. Give a bit of a test. And that way you can see how strong the glue joint is because when it's properly glued, that glue line will be stronger than the wood fibers itself. So that's I've got a samples here, we'll break them up um, and we'll see what happens. That's great. And you know, Scott, I have uh, some boards I glued together with hide glue too, and I've been waiting for an opportunity to bust them apart and see what happens. Perfect, sounds like fun. Okay, Tom, I'm all set up here. So for our viewers sake, this is the cherry board that has a compromised seam here. It was not a tight joint. This is a piece of oak that I've laminated with a very tight joint. So I'm gonna break both of these. And so I'm not putting stress on a certain part of the wood to influence where it's going to break. I'm just suspending it between two boards and I'm gonna hit it right on that seam and we'll see what happens. Well, that was fun busting some boards. Here on the cherry, where I had a glue line that wasn't tight, I expected it to break on the glue line, but for the most part, it didn't. It was the wood fibers that broke themselves. 
there's just a small part down here where the glue you can see it here and that's where it had let go on this board here this is the oak that i put together it also broke on the wood fibers for the most part down here it looks like it might have broken on the glue line but it's splintering of wood that's coming apart so the glue held uh, the wood failed so these show you the power of pva glue also known as carpenter's glue yellow glue elmer's glue um, so this is really important for me to make sure that i've got a glue that i can run an eye on this is a, an example of a glue up that's important to make sure it doesn't come apart. This is a blank for a turning. This is an upcoming project where I'm reproducing this table leg. So as this is spinning on the lathe, I don't want any doubt that this isn't going to come apart on me and cause some injury. So this is the power of the glue that you'd use on a lot of modern furniture. But let's take a look at what happens with uh, high glue and how it breaks. This is a new video format for Tom and I, and we'd like to hear your feedback on what you like about it and what you don't. And we'll be able to gauge whether this is a good video format for us. So here I've got a, a couple of poplar boards, which I've glued together with hide glue. And I've let this cure for, uh, geez, over a month now. Place it between these boards like this. I've got a nice heavy mallet here. Let's see what happens. Wow, that was interesting. You know, it's funny. People think that hide glue is not that strong. I think just because it's so easily reversible with water. But this was incredibly strong. Uh, the joint didn't break at all. What broke was the wood. It, uh, it's unscientific, but it seems to demonstrate that the glue joint is stronger than the wood itself. And so once you've achieved that, Anything else is superfluous. Another thing I wanted to share with our viewers is spreading glue. So I read an article in Fine Woodworking years ago that you shouldn't actually use your fingers to spread the glue because the oils in our hands can weaken the glue. So I use an artist brush when I spread my glue. Um, I use one that has uh, short bristles and uh, also I use the end of the brush to get into mortises as well because it's great for making sure you've got that full mortise covered off in glue. That's a great idea. I may use that myself. Although I've been using my little acid brushes uh, for years to spread glue around. And because we're using water-based glues, these just wash up with soap and water, no issue. Yeah. So the third glue we wanna talk about is epoxy. And here's an example of some epoxy. Um, this is a chemical-based glue. So unlike the high glue and the PVA that can be water-based cleanup, uh, this stuff is a lot more difficult to clean up. Um, now, there's a few spots that we use this in our shop, but not all that common. And Tom, what's the key thing that we're looking for in using a joint and deciding whether to use uh, epoxy or not? Well, you know, Scott, your stick is a perfect illustration of one of the advantages of epoxy, is that epoxy can bridge a gap. So say you have a situation where Though the, the you cannot have good wood to wood contact. Now, sometimes if a joint is loose, you can add a piece of veneer, uh, and that's always good for joints. But sometimes with repairs, especially if if something is shattered, you're just not never going to have good glue surface and able to have good pressure. And that's where epoxy can really come in handy. And I might add here that. With antiques and actually all furniture, you shouldn't use epoxy to glue the joints together of a piece of furniture. Usually if a joint is loose, you can add a piece of veneer or add some cloth to fill that gap. But it's more when you have really bad damage, shattered pieces of wood, shattered legs, where the epoxy really is necessary to, to, to make something structurally sound again. Yeah, and I can see that in the antique space. Um, in Toronto, I work on more modern pieces. Yes. Um, and some of those pieces I put together were originally put together with epoxy or modern glues like that. Wow. Um, they don't have stretchers between the legs, so they're more yeah. flexible. And the joinery is such a way that the only thing I can use to get those together reliably and have them last for decades is to use epoxy. Um, yeah. So there are a few cases where I use it in joinery, but that's very rare. 
uh, most of the stuff is uh, PVA or high glue. Yeah, we, we constantly run into situations working on furniture where the joinery is not the best and you simply have to make do with what you've got. Yeah. yeah. Now, Tom, I saw in a video you had recently published about using epoxy and coloring the epoxy to fill a void. I think it was in the side of a cabinet. Yeah. Well, I had one really recently, just a few videos back with a shattered leg where I colored the epoxy so that any, any gaps that were left when I took the clamps off uh, would already be colored to the proper color of the piece of furniture. Uh, that's one of the uh, nice things about the epoxy that you can do. So what do you use to tint or color that? I use these powdered stains that I get from Mohawk Finishing. They're called Blendall stains. And they're soluble in alcohol. And so is epoxy. And so they work great. I use two different types of epoxy in my repairs. This is a thicker off-the-shelf uh, formula that uh, really has a good thickness to it. I've also recently got into the West Systems. And I noticed with the West Systems, they're a lot runnier. And, and I purchased that for a repair that I'm doing. And here was the leftover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is, I really like the quality of this. And it doesn't have that pungent smell, that really chemical smell that this has. Yeah. Um, but how do you thicken this so that it's not as runny as what it is when it comes right out of the container? They sell a variety of uh, fillers or thickeners for that uh, epoxy. And I'm not sure what the purpose of all the, the, the various fillers are. But from the start, when I first purchased West System, I was advised to use their colloidal silica. And that's what I use. It's a white powder. And you can mix in as much or as little as you want. And it really is, is, that's one of the great things about epoxy. You can use it in that super liquid form to get down into places that you couldn't otherwise get. Mm. In fact, frequently when using it, I'll use it unthinned initially to coat the surfaces, to get into areas where I want it to seep into, then thicken it and complete the glue up with the thickened epoxy so it doesn't run out of the joint or the or the break we know whatever i'm repairing doesn't just run out like water yeah. and uh, and then you can color it at that same time too okay well it's funny the reason that i picked this up is because i produced uh shabby chic doors a custom build for a customer and unbeknownst to me there was a piece that was flawed and there's a crack in the door so I'm going to pick up that door, bring it back, and I bought the epoxy to fill in that void. So it's the perfect tool for that particular job. Oh, um, great. So I'm gonna have a repair video coming up on that. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, it's my warranty job, um, but hey, I'm <laughs> like, I, we all make mistakes. <laughs> but it brings up the point how necessary and useful epoxy is, and it has to be part of your toolkit. Tom and I have talked about three different glues that we frequently use in our shop. I've got three others that I use in my shop as well. I've created a separate video that show all six together. I'll leave a link in the video description below if you're curious. Well, I hope our viewers find this a useful video format. Tom, what do you think we should talk about next? Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. I hope people like it. And you know, I pay a lot of attention to people's comments and frequently ask questions. And people are always commenting about clamps and clamping. So I thought that could be a good thing to share and we can compare notes between our shops. Oh yeah, that would be really good. And you know, some of those really difficult things we have that we clamp, um, that can be challenging for people that are not that experienced how to, how to do that. So yeah, we could certainly talk about our clamps and maybe we could show our clamp collection and what we've got going on. Yeah, that would be fun. And, you know, speaking of which, I keep looking at the cabinet behind you, your tool cabinet. What's going on with that? <laughs> so I started this project almost two years ago. Um, as I have time, I put another piece into it. Um, it's a bit stalled right now. I've actually been going through tool acquisition. I bought my first Japanese saw. Nice, nice. Building this uh, cabinet in a way that it's adjustable, but I'm trying to find the right tools that I want to commit to it. Um, yes. Yeah. So I don't have to constantly change it. So uh, first Japanese saw, a uh, pull saw. Um, I've been using Western saws so far. So uh, I'm really eager to try that out a little bit more. Yeah, I'm totally into Japanese saws too. And that could be another video. Oh yeah, that's right. It could be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Well, it's gross. been a great conversation, Tom. Um, I, I enjoyed this video. I look forward to the next one. And I hope our viewers enjoyed as well. Me too.